I want to do three things. First, I want to say a bit more about how I got my clerkship in the first place. Second, I have one good story about the clerkship that isn't on the website. And third, I want to try to place Justice Ginsburg into larger context. So first, I originally had no interest in clerking when I was in law school. I viewed a clerkship as a way to prolong adolescence. And as one of the oldest students in my class, I had managed to do that just fine on my own. But several of my professors encouraged me with varying levels, indeed increasing levels of persistence that I throw my hat into the ring. So I came up with a plan. I would apply to a handful of judges with whom I had no chance the professors would write their recommendation letters and nothing would happen, so I would get on with my life. Things didn't quite go according to the plan. I did everything wrong in applying to Justice Ginsburg. I mean everything. And it started right away. Based on incomplete information, I assumed that she was already on the DC circuit when I sent in my application. Some time later, I got a letter not from Washington, but from Columbia Law School, where she was still on the faculty. It was a nice letter explaining that her nomination had only recently gone to the Senate, uh, but she also asked me for more information. So I sent that. Then she asked me for more information. So I sent that. And then, she invited me to come to New York to interview at her home. That's how I came to knock on her door shortly after 9.30 in the morning on June 18th, 1980, where I was greeted by her then 15-year-old son who said to me, I was going to ask you why you want a clerk for an unconfirmed judge, but I can't do that. The Senate just confirmed her, she just got the phone call. So I was the first person outside of her family whom she saw. We had our conversation, she made the offer, I took it. Okay. Second, quick story from the clerkship. The clerks divided the cases that would be argued in each sitting and we wrote bench memos on every case that was going to be argued. A few days before the argument, the judge would meet with each of us to discuss our cases. One that stands out was a libel case against the Washington Post. The case reached us on an arcane procedural issue, not on the merits, but the briefs were, to put it mildly, vitriolic. After we discussed the legal issues, the judge remarked about the harsh tone of the briefs. I offered a hypothesis. One of the plaintiffs was George Preston Marshall Jr., whose father was the founder and longtime owner of what until recently was called the Washington Redskins. Now, the post was represented by Williams and Connolly, whose senior partner, Edward Bennett Williams, owned the Redskins after Marshall Sr. did. Williams detested Marshall Sr. and the feeling was mutual. Williams thought that Marshall Sr. was an unreconstructed racist and he had some basis for that. The Redskins were the last team in the National Football League to have a black player. I suggested that the terrible personal relationship between Williams and Marshall Sr. might have something to do with the tone of the briefs. The judge listened attentively and then in all seriousness asked, what are the Redskins? Now, of course, she had many interests outside of the law. Sports was not among them. Now, some more general points. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a figure of national stature when she became a judge. She would have been an important person historically 
even if she never sat on the Supreme Court. In that sense, she was similar to Thurgood Marshall, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and William Howard Taft, all of whom had distinguished careers before their appointments to the court. Ginsburg was a leading scholar who wrote extensively on procedure and jurisdiction, as well as constitutional law. More important, she led a litigation campaign that resulted in a fundamental transformation in the law of gender discrimination. Uh, when she began those efforts, the court in its entire history had never struck down a gender-based law as unconstitutional, but it had, it had upheld quite a few, including some where the court clearly refused to take the claim seriously. Then Professor Ginsburg changed all that in cases that she argued and in others on which she advised. She was a brilliant lawyer and a shrewd strategist, as shown by her enthusiasm for using male plaintiffs as part of the campaign for gender equality. And she brought that strategic sense to the Supreme Court, especially when she became the most senior member of the, li of the liberal wing in 2010. She helped to keep the group un unified in some high profile cases. And sometimes that meant not writing separately, even when there was plenty to say. Take, for instance, Obergefell against Hodges, the same-sex marriage decision. That was a five to four ruling in which Justice Kennedy wrote for the court. His opinion was unconventional in many ways, and almost certainly the other justices in the majority would have written it differently. But none of those justices wrote anything. I don't have any inside information, but I strongly suspect that Justice Ginsburg had something to do with that. She would have hesitated to write separately so as not to undermine the force of the court's ruling. And I further suspect that one way or another, she conveyed her views to Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Kagan. Similarly, last term in Bostock against Clayton County, which held that employment discrimination based on sexual orientation violates Title VII, Justice Gorsuch wrote for a six to three court, relying exclusively on textualism to interpret the statute. There are other approaches to statutory interpretation, but none of the liberal justices said anything about those alternatives. And I see the strategic hand of Justice Ginsburg there too. During her entire time on the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg was in the minority. Most of the justices were appointed by Republican presidents. Indeed, when she was confirmed in 1993, she was the first Democratic appointee in 26 years. In the meantime, there were 11 consecutive Republican appointees. Now, she wrote at least her share of opinions for the court, most notably United States against Virginia, which struck down the male only admission policy of the Virginia Military Institute. But she will probably be best remembered for her dissents. One notable example is Ledbetter against Goodyear Tire and Rubber, which rejected a claim of gender based pay discrimination as untimely. Justice Ginsburg strongly disagreed with the majority's, what she called, parsimonious reading of Title VII and explained in detail why the claim not only was timely, but in her view, meritorious. She concluded by noting that it would be up to Congress to amend the statute to make clear that claims like Ledbetter's were timely. And that was in fact, one of the first pieces of legislation that Congress passed in 2009. Her dissent in Shelby County against Holder, which got it a central part of the Voting Rights Act, challenged Chief Justice Roberts's majority opinion in virtually every particular. As she put it, throwing out that provision when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. In this respect, Justice Ginsburg's legacy might be like Justice Holmes's, more famous for her dissents, even though she wrote a good number of opinions for the court. And here I want to conclude by returning to my earlier observation about her national stature, even before she went on the bench. 
Justice Ginsburg was confirmed unanimously for her seat on the DC circuit and virtually unanimously for her seat on the Supreme Court. That would never happen today. The parties are much more polarized than they have been in the past and ideological re reliability is the main, indeed, for many people, the only qualification for a place on the bench. These days, the field of acceptable candidates is defined in terms of track record, which for Supreme Court seats means prior judicial service. Today, the combination of polarized parties and the ability of a simple majority of senators to confirm a nominee aggravates our larger political crisis. Ruth Bader Ginsburg might be the last widely recognized figure of national stature to be appointed to the Supreme Court for years to come. Indeed, our current political polarization raises the question whether there can be general recognition of figures of national stature. I hope I am wrong about that. Still, tonight, I am deeply saddened not only by the death of my judge, but also by the grim prognosis for the Supreme Court as an institution and my country as a whole. Okay, well, hopefully we can have more uplifting remarks um, <laughs> later on. Uh, who is going next? Okay, I will decide, Jonathan Adler. Okay, well, um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, my remarks won't be anywhere as interesting or, or illuminating as, as Jonathan's were, but I wanted to um, say a little bit about some aspects of Justice Ginsburg's career and time on the courts that were perhaps uh, less known, uh, and um, including uh, some of her important opinions uh, in areas that she might not be known for. I, I agree very much with Jonathan that she is um, on the Supreme Court, usually remembered for her dissents, um, and uh, particularly in high profile cases, as the senior most. Uh, liberal justice for much of her time on the court, um, or much of the last, much of the Roberts court, I should say, um, she had the decision to, or the, the authority to decide who would write the lead dissent in many cases that, that divided the court along ideological lines and um, took that opportunity, particularly in some of the cases that uh, Jonathan noted. Now, I'm, some of the things I think are important to note about uh, Justice Ginsburg um, well, first, she was a former academic, which for us, I think, is something was always important to highlight. We should always be, we're always in favor of academics uh, being on the bench. Um, she taught both at Rutgers and at uh, Columbia Law School, um, the latter being where she graduated from law school. As I think many people know, uh, she was um, one of a handful of women to attend Harvard Law School in the 1950s. Uh, but when she and her husband, Marty, decided they were moving to New York, uh, Harvard would not let her allow her to continue to be enrolled if she was not going to be taking classes in Cambridge. Uh, so she transferred to Columbia and ended up graduating from Columbia instead. Uh, and the story is, is that when Harvard later wanted to offer her a JD, uh, she said, no, thank you, that they had had their chance, um, but was willing to let them give her an honorary degree. Uh, after her close to two decades of teaching, as Jonathan mentioned, she was on the DC circuit. Um, and a bunch of things are interesting about her time on the DC circuit. One uh, was the close friendships she struck up with both uh, Justice Scalia, who joined the DC circuit shortly after uh, she did, uh, and also with uh, Justice Thomas, who um, uh, up until this past week, uh, almost all of Justice Thomas's career was spent with um, uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, as, as a colleague, given the relatively short time between his elevation to the Supreme Court uh, and hers. And I'll say a little bit more about her relationship with Justice Scalia um, uh, in a moment. On the DC Circuit, you know, this is a, this is an, a court that mostly focus on, focuses on administrative law questions. This was not the, the area of law that Justice Ginsburg herself focused on. Uh, she was actually a, a civil procedure scholar, uh, and in fact, also a bit of a comparativist. After law school, she uh, did a project uh, looking at the civil procedure of Sweden, and apparently post-law school taught herself Swedish so that she could do this, 
Uh, and um, if you look at a lot of the opinions that she wrote, a lot of the areas of law that she focused on, apart from the high profile constitutional cases, uh, you can see her focus and interest in, in civil procedure and her interest in, in parsing texts like, uh, like the rules. Uh, but during her time on the DC circuit, she actually had a role in some important cases. Uh, one thing that a lot of people forget is that um, in, a, in, in a case called In Resealed Case, which, uh, which was the lower court opinion in what became Morrison versus Olson, uh, she wrote the dissent to Judge Silberman's opinion, holding that the Independent Counsel Act was unconstitutional, a dissent that was subsequently vindicated uh, in Morrison versus Olson uh, in, an, in a seven to one opinion written by Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, her whole uh, dissent is, is worth a read. I think it's worth quoting uh, from uh, the, the closing paragraph from that dissent. Uh, the Ethics in Government Act is a carefully considered congressional journey into the sometimes arcane realm of the separation of powers doctrine, more particularly into areas the framers left undefined. The act is designed to prevent Congress's own appropriation of the functions it insulates from executive supervision, and it implements a fundamental control essential to our Constitution's doctrine of separated powers. The control of mutual checks, or, 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 sorry, Constitution's doctrine of separated powers, the control of mutual checks. It is a measure faithful to the 18th century blueprint, yet fitting for our time. I find the Ethics Act constitutional and would affirm the judgments of the district court. And I think on uh, Justice Ginsburg's passing, I think it's worth you know, highlighting this dissent because I think this dissent is a very clear articulation of a particular view of separation of powers, not only um, the one that was ultimately vindicated by the court, but one that stands in contrast to the conception of separation of powers associated with Justice Scalia's Morrison versus Olson dissent, which is regularly quoted, taught, uh, and pointed to. And particularly uh, when her opinion is placed side by side with Chief Justice Rehnquist's Morrison decision, uh, I think hers is the clearer, uh, better articulated account of an alternative view of separation of powers to that uh, presented by her good friend, Justice Scalia. And it would certainly be fitting to her legacy if we recovered this dissent uh, and, and thought of it as a, a, an art, a good articulation of this alternative view. Another case she was involved in um, where the outcome, at least for her point of view, uh, was, not, uh, was, not, was not as positive and where by historical accident, she has arguably been associated with what we may think of as a DC circuit mistake is that she was assigned the lower court opinion in Chevron versus NRDC. Uh, so she wrote the opinion in the DC circuit that invalidated uh, the Reagan administration's effort to reinterpret the Clean Air Act and adopt what was called a bubble policy, which was designed to make it easier for regulated firms to comply with the Clean Air Act's requirements uh, by giving them more flexibility in, in firm operations and making it easier to avoid the obligation to install additional pollution control equipment. Uh, under a range of uh, several DC circuit opinions, this sort of policy was only allowed in parts of the country that were obligated to maintain existing levels of air quality as opposed to those parts of the countries that were obligated to reduce existing levels of air pollution. And on that basis, uh, Justice Ginsburg wrote the opinion striking down the Reagan administration policy. Uh, her, this opinion was, in many respects, also vintage Ginsburg. It was not uh, a, a textual exegesis so much as it was focused on the understanding of the Clean Air Act as it had been applied and implemented, as well as how it had been interpreted in the courts. Um, she was unimpressed by the Reagan administration's fairly cursory explanation of why they wanted to change the policy uh, and wrote what was a fairly straightforward opinion explaining why uh, given that there was uh, no textual command for this approach, no obligation in the statute to be found in the legislative history, which in her words was at best contradictory, the Reagan administration uh, policy should be rejected. Now, as I think folks may be aware, the Chevron doctrine is something that's controversial today. Uh, it was adopted by the Supreme Court in the unanimous opinion overturning Justice Ginsburg's lower court opinion. What's perhaps ironic about the fact that her opinion was the one that was reversed 
is that of the various DC Circuit opinions adopting this approach to the Clean Air Act, hers was by far the most restrained, uh, the least bombastic, uh, and the least policy oriented in its exegesis. If you think about some of the other DC Circuit judges uh, that she uh, uh, spent time with that were also writing opinions in this period, judges like uh, Skelly Wright, uh, these were judges that were known for being very aggressive in their statutory interpretations, adopting broad purposivist interpretations that forced agencies to do things they didn't want to do. And one might have thought that those would have been the opinions that the Supreme Court singled out to reverse. Uh, but for whatever reason, it was her more modest, more restrained opinion uh, that the Supreme Court opted to review. And so for whatever reason, uh, you know, she is, is the one who is associated with the DC Circuit's lower court er error. And is it also doubly ironic because today it is not liberal justices that are raising questions about Chevron doctrine, uh, but rather justices uh, on the right. Uh, on the Supreme Court, as I already noted, she wrote lots of opinions related to civil procedure and statutory interpretation. Uh, I wanted to highlight just a couple uh, cases uh, that, that are worth remembering. Uh, one is she wrote what is one of the most important standing decisions, uh, particularly in the area of environmental citizen suits, a case called Friends of the Earth versus Laidlaw Environmental Services. And here again, uh, her opinion is the counterpoint to the relevant Scalia opinion. Her opinion in Friends of the Earth versus Laidlaw Environmental Services put the brakes on Justice Scalia's effort to redraw the law of standing to make it more difficult for citizen suits and activist groups to engage in litigation. Uh, she wrote an opinion for seven justices. It was not a 5-4 decision. Uh, Justice Scalia lost soundly uh, in that case. And the case also was extremely important for cleaning up and expounding upon the law of mootness, especially as it applies to uh, the enforcement of environmental statutes. It's a particularly important environmental decision uh, and one that I think is often overlooked uh, that she wrote. One other environmental decision I wanted to note, just because it, 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 there are some fun facts about it, is that she wrote the, the opinion for the court in a six to two decision, uh, an EPA versus EME Homer City generation. It involved interstate air pollution. Uh, the fun fact about this case is that this is the only case in which the Supreme Court overturned a decision by then Judge Brett Kavanaugh on the DC circuit. Uh, so the one time uh, Judge Kavanaugh, then Judge Kavanaugh uh, was reversed uh, wasn't an opinion uh, that was written by Justice Ginsburg. And perhaps that is fitting uh, given what happened to her uh, in the Chevron case. As Jonathan already noted, you know, during, during much of the past decade, she was the, the senior most liberal justice. And that certainly uh, meant she was writing fewer majorities uh, and far more dissents and deciding uh, who was uh, going to write dissents. Uh, but the last thing I just wanted to mention very briefly uh, is to comment a little bit on uh, her friendship with uh, Justice Scalia in particular, uh, a friendship that was very close over their time on both the DC Circuit and the Supreme Court, and a friendship that withstood their quite stark disagreements on matters of statutory interpretation, uh, the Constitution, uh, and much else. Uh, she wrote the foreword to the first book of uh, Scalia's writings that was published uh, after his death. Uh, he wrote uh, the mini profile of her uh, in Time Magazine's 2015 uh, issue dedicated to American icons. Uh, in that uh, issue, he wrote that, uh, having had the good fortune to serve beside her on both courts, I can attest that her opinions are always thoroughly considered, almost carefully crafted, are always carefully crafted and almost always correct, which is to say we sometimes disagree. That much is apparent for all to see. What only her colleagues know is that her suggestions improve the opinions the rest of us write, and that she is a source of collegiality and good judgment in all our work. In fact, it is known that at times on both the DC Circuit and the Supreme Court, she would occasionally line edit the opinions of her colleagues prior to publication. Another comment that Scalia uh, made uh, about uh, Justice Ginsburg at a joint appearance some years ago uh, about their friendship was, what's not to like, except her views on the law. We agree on a whole lot of stuff, he added. Ruth is really bad only on the knee-jerk stuff. Uh, and of course, she said similar things about him. In an interview, uh, 
or with Joan Biskupic, uh, she, she said, Nino, in my view, sometimes does go overboard. It would be better if he dropped things like, this opinion is not to be taken seriously. He might have been more influential here if he did not do that. I love him, but sometimes I'd like to strangle him. Uh, they were great friends, um, and uh, I think that in a time like ours, where the partisan differences are as strong and as deep as they are uh, in a time when it seems that people that disagree have such a hard time getting along, I think that the example she set uh, for having love and admiration for someone with whom she disagreed, with whom she disagreed, but uh, with whom she could still work is a model that is worth following. And I thought that was worth mentioning in our program today. Uh, and uh, I will uh, at this point, turn it over to whoever Professor Hoffman says is up next. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I do have one question. Could you uh, specify the name of the case where you discussed the first dissent? Was that Olson? So it's so so the, the Supreme Court case is Morrison versus Olson. The the lower court opinion where she wrote her dissent is just titled In Re Sealed Case. And that's because when sometimes when certain sorts of cases come up in the lower courts, they are initially sealed because they have to be you know looked at for confidential information and the like. And so in the DC circuit, there are a whole lot of cases um, with that title, but I will, um, in the Q&A box, I'll put the citation in the box for people that want to look it up. Thank you so much. Jesse, you're next. Thank you, Sharona. Um, well, I, what I wanna do is, is just take a little bit of time to talk about um, one particular area of law where Justice Ginsburg had an enormous influence, although she had an enormous influence in so many areas and divergent areas of law as the, the first two speakers remarks have demonstrated, I wanna focus on reproductive rights and particularly sort of give some context around Justice Ginsburg's jurisprudence in that area and how her, her um, philosophy contributed to where we are today in terms of reproductive rights and uh, what the future look briefly sort of a few remarks about what the future looks like without Justice Ginsburg on the court in this particular area. Um, so of course everybody, it's already in the news, everybody's thinking about Roe v. Wade um, and what the future is uh, for Roe v. Wade. Well in 1973 when Roe was decided, Justice Ginsburg was then an attorney um, litigating some of the early gender discrimination cases that my colleague Jonathan Enton uh, mentioned in his remarks. So um, uh, Reed versus Reed was in 1971. Frontiero v. Richardson was in 1973, decided a matter of days uh, before Roe. And uh, uh, Weinberger v. Weisenfeld was in 1975. Of course, Justice Ginsburg was not appointed to the Supreme Court. She did her stint on the DC Circuit and then was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1993. Um, that was the year after the landmark case, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which is still the case that sets out the legal standard by which abortion restrictions are judged, the constitutionality of abortion restrictions um, are judged today. So in between um, that time or during the 1980s, uh, Justice Ginsburg, uh, who was then Judge Ginsburg, <laughs> put forward a very influential view that Roe should have been decided on equality grounds rather than on the right to privacy. She uh, suggested, among other things, that this basis for recognizing a right to terminate a pregnancy, gender equality, um, would have been less controversial and it would have been more reflective of what abortion restrictions are really all about. The real essence of abortion restrictions is that they um, compromise women's equal citizenship. Um, of course, 
this was the world that she came from, right? The world of sort of litigating for gender equality. Um, and, um, but at the same time, that's the sort, the entire doctrine of gender equality was very separate at the time from the doctrine of privacy out of which um, the right to abortion grew. You know, I don't know whether in the end um, we would have ended up anywhere different than where we are today um, in terms of abortion rights if we, if the court had pursued the path that Justice Ginsburg suggested um, in terms of seeing abortion, the abortion right as an aspect of equality rather than privacy. Um, but it's interesting to note that Casey, the landmark case decided in 1992, clearly reflects this greater equality focus. And actually much of the Supreme Court's abortion rights gender, uh, jurisprudence since that time um, is more cognizant of the sort of e equality concerns that Justice Ginsburg raised. Um, so, you know, in, in abortion rights cases, Justice Ginsburg was always um, a staunch sort of reliable pro-choice vote. Um, but interestingly, given the long shadow that she casts over this issue, um, she did not um, she did not author any of the majority opinions in any of the major um, abortion rights cases when she was on the Supreme Court. So she had some very um, important and influ again influential uh, concurrences and dissents, but even when she was voting with the majority, she did not generally write the opinion. Um, I think what really stands out about some of Justice Ginsburg's opinions in the abortion rights area is kind of how clearly, how clear eyed they were and how clearly she sort of cuts through the nonsense um, and sees right to the heart of what is going on in the case. For example, in a 2007 case, Gonzalez v. Carhart, the majority uh, voted to uphold a ban on a particular method of abortion on the ground that it was inhumane, essentially, um, and that women, one, of, one aspect of the court's rationale was that women would be upset if, and, and suffer regret if they learned afterwards uh, that the abortion had been performed in this inhumane way. This, this um, was the court's decision, even though the court acknowledged um, that the alternative procedure that women would have to undergo now um, could bring greater safety risks for some women. Uh, Justice Ginsburg dissented in this case and said of the majority's opinion, quote, because of women's fragile emotional state and because of the quote, bond of love the mother has for her child, that bond of love language is from the uh, majority's opinion. The court worries doctors may withhold information about the nature of the procedure. The solution the court approves then is not to require doctors to inform women accurately and adequately of the different procedures and their attendant risks. Instead, the court deprives women of the right to make an autonomous choice, even at the expense of their safety. And then she went on to say, this way of thinking reflects ancient notions about women's place in the family and under the constitution, ideas that have long since been discredited. And then she goes on to cite actually some of the cases that again, um, uh, John Enton had mentioned some of the early cases, paternalistic cases upholding um, discriminatory laws against women, and then later cases rejecting that line of thinking, that paternalistic line of thinking. Uh, she, she ends by saying, or, or ends this passage by saying, though today's majority may regard women's feelings on the matter as self-evident, this court has repeatedly confirmed that the destiny of the woman must be shaped on her own conception of her spiritual imperatives and her place in society.
So I think it's, you know, one example of how um, these, this sort of conception of reproductive rights and abortion rights under an equality framework really um, worked their way into um, not just Justice uh, Ginsburg's jurisprudence on abortion rights, but also into the sort of broader understanding um, uh, in, in Casey and subsequent cases as well. Um, similarly, again, another sort of clear-eyed concurrence actually in the 2016 case, Whole Woman's Health, uh, the Hellerstedt. Um, in that case, the court struck down some um, restrictions on abortion clinics that would shut down in Texas three quarters of the state's abortion clinics um, and bring little to no medical or safety benefit to patients. Um, so Justice Ginsburg was voting with the majority but made a point of writing a separate brief concurrence um, just to highlight essentially the highly pretextual nature of the abortion restrictions um, that were claimed to be for women's benefit, but in fact were actually sub likely to subject women to greater health risks because they would have the effect of shutting down clinics, leaving women without safe legal options um, for seeking abortions. Finally, um, she um, had several opinions as well, or she had some, some notable opinions as well in the context of birth control and access to birth control and um, religious exemptions from birth control, uh, man, the birth control mandate under the Affordable Care Act, including in the Hobby, Hobby Lobby case, um, as well as in the, the case of Little Sisters of the Poor, just from um, this past term decided on July 8th. Um, Little Sisters of the Poor v. Pennsylvania. She talked about Congress's determination in the Affordable Care Act to afford women employees equal access to preventive services, thereby advancing public health and welfare um, and women's well being. Uh, again, tying uh, contraceptive access to gender equality um, in dissenting from the majority's decision to uphold at least. Um, uh, in, on the, uh, certain bases to uphold the broad religious exemption um, that the Trump administration had created for employers. Okay, so two minutes just to say what, <laughs> what comes next here. Um, I think in terms of reproductive rights, the elephant in the room is certainly the future of Roe v. Wade. Um, if as appears likely, a new justice is appointed um, who is on the conservative, um, sort of the most conservative end of the spectrum on the Supreme Court. I think there will be likely three reliable votes on the Supreme Court to, to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, there are three reliable votes, the three remaining liberal justices, to um, keep Roe v. Wade. Um, I think the justices who would vote to overturn it are Thomas, Alito, and whoever is coming next. Um, so there are two who I might say are in the middle, uh, Justice Kavanaugh and Chief Justice Roberts, um, but I would not say that those are um, in the middle in the sense you might traditionally think of on this issue. They are sort of the median justices on this issue, and really it's probably Kavanaugh, um, uh, who is the median justice on the issue. Um, I somehow left Justice Gorsuch just completely off the court. I must have just um, repressed him in my mind, <laughs> but he's the fourth vote, sorry, on the conservative wing um, to overrule Roe. I don't know why um, I left him off. Um, so we have, I think, Roberts and Kavanaugh on the, um, as the median justices on the court, right in the middle of the two, and really it's probably Kavanaugh. Chief Justice Roberts wrote a very, um, a very lukewarm defense of stare decisis in the Supreme Court case of June Medical Services v. Russo this past term, and then also um, uh, 
Justice Kavanaugh has been playing his cards very close to the chest and not really giving us an indication of where he's going, but he has been on the record in the past as being um, not a big fan of Roe v. Wade. So, um, so that's where we are at the moment. And I will just finally note that there are some cases um, making their way up um, through the Supreme Court right now um, that um, could potentially be the, the case where the court considers uh, overturning Roe v. Wade. There is a 15 week abortion ban out of Mississippi where there is a cert petition currently pending, for example, as well as probably a dozen other cases sitting in the, the courts of appeals right now. Um, and the Supreme Court could decide to hear any one of them as soon as this coming term. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop there and turn it over, I guess, to Sharona and Ray. Thanks. Okay. Well, just a reminder, please type your questions into the Q&A um, box. The icon is at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will now hear from Professor Ray Ku. All right, uh, thank you, Sharona. And I, I'm trying to do my best to add to all the wonderful comments uh, from my colleagues. Uh, and I'll, I'll proceed in two parts. Uh, the first is just going to be a kind of things you may not know about Justice Ginsburg uh, in terms of her role as both a justice and as a litigator. Uh, and then my overall reflections on, I think, what we're sorely going to miss uh, in terms of her contributions as a justice. Uh, and so first, uh, you know, one of the things that Sharona mentioned is kind of my interest in uh, technology, internet law. And for those of you that follow that field, one of the most important decisions uh, for quite some time was uh, the decision in Eldred versus Ashcroft, uh, which was a copyright decision in which uh, the Supreme Court upheld Congress's decision to retroactively and proactively extend uh, the term of copyright protection uh, for 20 years. Uh, and Justice Ginsburg wrote the majority opinion uh, for seven justices. Uh, what most people don't necessarily know is, uh, yes, Justice Ginsburg served on the faculty of Columbia Law School, uh, and her daughter, Jane Ginsburg, uh, also <laughs> serves on that faculty and is, in fact, one of the world's leading experts in copyright law. Uh, and uh, along those lines, uh, She's not uh, what often critics would describe as the copy left, uh, kind of the more uh, minimal uh, copyright protection approach towards the law. Uh, she has been fundamentally in the camp that uh, copyright serves a very, very valuable public purpose uh, and should be as robust as possible. Uh, so it's fundamentally not, it wasn't very surprising uh, when <laughs> Justice Ginsburg uh, wrote the opinion that she did in terms of recognizing the importance of copyright uh, and its policy and its role in uh, kind of encouraging creativity and the distribution of the work. I mean, one can only really imagine uh, if she had struck down the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Ex uh, Extension Act, what the dinner conversations would have been like uh, with her daughter afterwards. Uh, so, you know, totally random story along these lines, just simply because most of you may not have known she wrote one of the most important copyright uh, opinions at the end of the 20th century. Uh, the other kind of comes on, I, I, I think it was John uh, Adler who was making the point that, you know, she, she was also an academic and, and many of us academics uh, certainly love the idea that an academic would be appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, it really <laughs> doesn't happen very often, uh, if really ever, uh, because I want to emphasize too that, um, you know, and, and uh, Professor Enton really emphasized this as well as Professor Hill, uh, that uh, Justice Ginsburg really in, in my mind kind of is one of two of the justices in essentially the court's history uh, that was a major pioneer as a litigator. Uh, so if we think of Thurgood Marshall's uh, role in equal protection and desegregation cases, right, his strategy uh, for the NAACP has often been uh, considered the, fun the strategy that ended up leading to uh, the victory in Brown versus Board of Education, uh, ending public segregation. Uh, as, as Jesse pointed out, uh, you know, Justice Ginsburg's approach towards litigating gender discrimination cases 
uh, easily fit within that mold. Uh, I mean, so many of the early gender discrimination cases weren't simply that uh, women were being discriminated against, uh, or that uh, the government was relying on outdated stereotypes, uh, but actually fundamentally based on circumstances and cases in which women actually benefited from the discrimination, right? So uh, men were essentially penalized uh, for the regulations and laws at issue. And her emphasis, however, was even though that was true, right? So even though the laws on their face seemingly, seemingly benefited women, they were still fundamentally uh, denying women equal protection uh, because ultimately their theories uh, were based on a view of women as essentially inferior uh, to men uh, in reality and in the law, right? And so uh, an example of you know, what I think was in the end a very uh, successful long-term strategy on changing the equal protection doctrines view of women uh, under the equal protection clause. Uh, and before we go on then to the other element here is she tried that recently uh, in the Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Redistricting case, uh, a case uh, involving uh, gerrymandering, uh, not one uh, specifically aimed at partisan gerrymandering as uh, the Commonwealth uh, versus Rucho case uh, ultimately became. Uh, but this was a decision before Rucho uh, in which she was able to get a five justice majority uh, to make essentially the point that partisan gerrymandering and the practice of essentially the uh, practice of gerrymandering itself when it was not tied to represented democracy was in fact a threat uh, to democracy. Really, again, as a litigator uh, and as I teach my students when thinking about constitutional cases, uh, the best of the justices and the best attorneys are always thinking several cases ahead. And so uh, she had potentially laid the groundwork in the Arizona case uh, for a much firmer and uh, perhaps a more robust view of protecting uh, equal protection in the gerrymandering context. And you may even argue that to some extent she succeeded there uh, as the, the majority of the court essentially did recognize uh, that gerrymandering could in fact be anti-democratic. Uh, their conclusion, however, was essentially not based on that uh, kind of substantive uh, conclusion or result, but on the fact that they couldn't come up with a standard uh, for judging any remedy uh, for partisan gerrymandering, right? So uh, yeah, she was a, not only a brilliant justice, but a brilliant, uh, uh, you know, uh, static, uh, I'm sorry, strategic thinker uh, and litigator. Uh, so I, I did say I wanted to kind of overall end uh, with what I think uh, we will miss uh, from Justice Ginsburg's uh, role and, uh, you know, participation in the court. Uh, and it's really twofold, uh, though, as you'll see, they're interconnected. And the first is essentially her fundamental belief in the inclusiveness of the Constitution. And for her, right, the inclusiveness uh, is not a kind of li liberal position, right? It is not an example of uh, the elites and progressives in society rewriting the constitution. Uh, she saw this as fundamentally going back uh, to the original principles of the founding of this nation uh, and the Constitution itself, right? So uh, even though she would say that, yeah, when the framers wrote, we the people of the United States, uh, her view was uh, they certainly couldn't have meant everybody, especially given that uh, in her direct language, human bondage uh, was a thing, right? And the Constitution preserved slavery and certainly, quote, uh, not women, whatever their color, and not even men who own no property. It was rather an elite group. Um, but uh, her current approach was to essentially, and again, this is why I liked her relationship with Justice Marshall, uh, where she said he, she liked his position uh, because he didn't celebrate the original Constitution, but he celebrated what the Constitution had become. And in her view, she saw, uh, this is a quote from her specifically, I see my advocacy as part of an effort to make the equality principle everything the founders would have wanted it to be if they weren't held back by the society in which they lived and particularly the shame of slavery. 
Uh, so as we then kind of see through many of her uh, most influential opinions, uh, the importance of diversity and the importance of representation of different views uh, was a fundamental part of her jurisprudence, right? And of course, uh, you can't deny or overlook the circumstances that, as my colleagues have pointed out, she herself was fundamentally a minority uh, when she went to law school and she began her legal career. And so for her, uh, the kind of treatment of minorities at the elite level of education, at the elite levels of the legal profession as a justice, uh, a judge and a justice, uh, was a very personal experience for her. Uh, and in fact, uh, Eugene Scalia, Justice Scalia's son in a recent essay, uh, wrote that perhaps one of the reasons that uh, he and his father and Justice Ginsburg bonded uh, was the fact they both came essentially from more uh, minority and therefore outside groups uh, in the kind of elite legal system, right? She coming from the Jewish tradition and Justice Scalia uh, being an Italian Catholic, right? So um, they, they bonded in that sense of recognizing like the outsider status uh, that they had in the more kind of elite circles of American law. Uh, and so along those lines, right, well, we're thinking of her other prominent cases, right, uh, United States versus Virginia uh, has been raised, right, and this was, of course, uh, the conclusion that the Supreme Court reached uh, that uh, VMI, the Virginia, uh, Virginia Military Institute, had to, in fact, allow women uh, to apply to the university and it could not maintain its all-male status. Uh, and again, it was fundamentally based upon the idea that if we want elite leaders who are trained in an adversarial method of education uh, and who will then either go on to become leaders in the military or leaders in society, there is absolutely no reason women should be excluded from that. And, and her recognition, look, that there are plenty of men who would not desire that uh, is the same as the fact that there are plenty of women who may not desire that. Uh, the Any real differences uh, between men and women under those circumstances uh, were essentially assumptions uh, based on stereotypes and more limited traditional understandings of women and their role in society. Uh, and, and in that, uh, one of her, in one of her lines from that case is, is uh, one that I uh, particularly uh, enjoy, which is that inherent differences, uh, she would go, between men and women, uh, we have come to appreciate remain cause for celebration but not for denigration of the members of either sex or for artificial constraints on an individual's opportunity. Right? And uh, you know, it wasn't just gender equality uh, that she kind of championed uh, inclusiveness for. Uh, she wrote one of the concurring opinions in Grutter uh, versus Bollinger, uh, in which the Supreme Court upheld uh, the affirmative action program at the University of Michigan uh, School of Law. And one of the most important elements, and so th this goes to um, both the inclusiveness but the other element I find fundamentally important in Justice Ginsburg's work, the importance of facts. Uh, so I, I forgot which one of you raised earlier the idea that uh, she may be like Justice Holmes, uh, may be more uh, remembered by her dissents. Uh, but Justice Holmes uh, is also quite uh, famous for his view about experience and facts in understanding uh, the Constitution and common law uh, in general, right? And so Holmes once said that a page of history is worth a volume of logic, right? And uh, those of us who spend way too much time on constitutional law uh, may recognize that one of the fundamental disagreements uh, between what you might describe as uh, the conservative branch or the progressive or liberal branch is essentially over uh, questions about facts. Uh, right. So is it a fact that there are women who would be capable of participating in an adversarial method of education? Uh, is systemic discrimination against uh, African Americans in particular, but other uh, disenfranchised or minority groups, uh, a reality for the purposes of inclusion and representation in graduate school programs uh, and undergraduate programs um, in Shelby County versus Holder, as I, I believe John 
Jonathan Adler mentioned, right, just so we're talking about the Voting Rights Act, is the history and societal discrimination and treatment of African Americans with respect to voting still discriminatory in some, uh, in some cases, in some states, uh, justifying continued federal oversight of uh, those state elections, right? And again, uh, the idea that maybe we have moved past discrimination was an important element in her view, right? But she was uh, never willing to say that we are there yet, right? That uh, there is too much evidence uh, that both uh, in underrepresentation of uh, a potential originally uh, underrepresented groups in education and then uh, the treatment of African Americans in voting uh, and attempts to suppress uh, African American votes were certainly realities uh, that Congress in particular, as well as state governments could and should address. Um, and the, I'll, I'll leave with one other uh, point here, uh, and that is in that diversity and inclusion, she believed it was actually a, an important fundamental interest in terms of education policy. Right, so uh, diversity uh, and inclusion so that we the people actually represent all of the people um, wasn't simply a legal principle that was there to prevent uh, the, essentially um, the infringement of that by states uh, or by the federal government, but a positive, uh, a positive value uh, that states could in fact promote, right? So Grutter, uh, the example that affirmative action policies, we, we don't need to adopt them. Um, but they have very valuable educational societal purposes for their adoption. Uh, and I'll just leave very briefly, uh, in a decision called Christian Legal Society versus Martinez, uh, Justice Ginsburg wrote in the opinion that said that the University of Hastings School of Law uh, could consider uh, and limit student groups uh, to a funding as long as they had a commitment to allowing anyone uh, to be members of the group and serve as officers of the group. Now, while obviously there are certain groups that wouldn't want that, they would only want people to adhere uh, to their specific view viewpoints, uh, Justice Ginsburg was very clear in saying that a university could have as its educational goal and mission the inclusion of all individuals in society, even if that's not the rule uh, or the practice outside of uh, institutes and uh, the, of education and higher education. All right, uh, with that, I will kick it uh, back to Sharona. Thank you. Thank you for all those terrific um, comments. Again, please type your questions into the Q and A uh, at the bottom of your screen and. Um, Ray, it looks like if we're going to have uh, a Justice Amy Coney Barrett, we'll have another academic at least. So um, she taught at Notre Dame for, I think, a couple of decades. So I will um, start off just by the question that I think is on many minds, which is what do you experts predict regarding the replacement of Justice Ginsburg? What do you think is going to happen? Jonathan Anton? I'm not sure that I have sufficient detachment to, to give a coherent answer. I think it is a sign of the degraded state of political discourse that the Senate can't even agree on the terms of a resolution honoring Justice Ginsburg's memory because both sides seem to want to load it up with partisan shots. Um, so I don't really know where this is going, except I think it is pretty clear that, that uh, whoever President Trump nominates uh, is almost certainly going to be sold as a staunch conservative. Uh, and that person will be confirmed by a, a largely party line vote. But I think that we live in an era where, where essentially party line votes on Supreme Court nominations and, and lower court nominations raise fundamental questions about the, the notion of an independent judiciary and the whole concept of the rule of law. Um, 
That's why I ended as pessimistically as I did. I hope we will get through this, but I think we are in a bad place, and if anything, it will get worse. Okay, Jonathan Adler. I'm not going to offer a, a prediction. I mean, apparently we will have a nominee uh, this week. Um, and will there be a vote? Will there not be a vote? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I agree with much of what Jonathan Atten said that, that uh, Justin Skin, Justice Ginsburg is the last or the next to last judge or justice to be confirmed in what was really a different era in terms of the way Supreme Court um, uh, uh, nominees were were treated and considered. She was the last uh, nominee to only have a single digit number of votes uh, against her. She was confirmed uh, 97 to three, and um, her uh, the time from her nomination to confirmation was something like 44 days. Um, the average confirmation time since 1975 has been 70 days. Um, so I mean, she's on the much earlier end of that um, uh, book in large part because it was uh, such uh, a different, uh, such a different era. And um, that, and she, in, during her time on the court, repeatedly lamented the fact that the confirmation process uh, was no longer like the process was when she went through it. Uh, and um, uh, certainly when, um, after Justice Scalia died and, and Garland was proposed, she made those comments, but she had made those comments uh, earlier as well, that you know she she felt that a process under which um, a president was uh, presumed to be able to uh, nominate a justice who would be confirmed provided they were qualified uh, was a better way a better way to go, and that's certainly not been um, uh, the approach that many senators have adopted since, and increasingly um, that senators have adopted since, such that the last few. Uh, nominations have been by a, a party line votes or very close to party line votes. Ray, do you have any comment? Uh, but, you know, I, I agree with John Etten. Uh, this could go very badly. Uh, and at the very least, I, I do think that uh, whatever happens, the current state uh, and customs and traditions of the court will be fundamentally changed. Uh, whether it's going to be the pressure that's put on, uh, whether or not we will confirm a nomination uh, this, uh, you know, in the next couple of months before uh, the new president is sworn in, or what happens afterwards, right? Uh, because there will be, uh, to the extent uh, there is a new appointment now before uh, whether Trump gets reelected, uh, or if, uh, you know, a, a uh, I'm sorry, uh, Biden wins the presidency, uh, we will see a very strong effort on the part of the Democrats to reform the court uh, in either the composition of the court, the numbers of justices on the court, uh, or any other kinds of reforms along those lines. Um, and I do want to agree with my colleagues that part of the, the lament over this process is now it is, it's not just fundamentally political, because I, I would argue that um, political suggests that there, there's a kind of a greater uh, degree of discretion in the choices. Uh, one of the things that's happened is that we have, to quote Justice Scalia, essentially abandoned the view or at least um, kind of hardened our view of what a lawyer's job is, right? So uh, he once wrote in a dissent that, you know, they pretty much leave us alone, right, when they think we're doing lawyer's work, right? We're reading the text, we're reading statutes, reading precedent. Um, many people, and quite, uh, quite accurately, don't believe that's what, at the very least, the justices do on the Supreme Court anymore. Uh, and so hence, you, you get this uh, essential partisan divide. But the other aspect to, in the justices' defense is we're in the 21st century. Many of the fundamental issues uh, that we are debating today are truly issues that divide Americans based on fundamental principles. Now, some of these divisions have existed ever since the 18th century, um, but some of them have definitely calcified more over time, right? So, so we're not arguing about small questions anymore. We're arguing about big questions. Uh, and that is being you know, played out uh, in the political process right now. Uh, and frankly, it really is up to the Republicans, right? Uh, to what extent do they see 
uh, pushing the nominee under these circumstances as worth it uh, in terms of potentially losing uh, the, the Congress in both bodies, of the, including the Senate and the House, or if they think it may make more sense to kind of uh, play the more traditional uh, compromise game uh, and recognize that the McConnell rule is a little bit of an odd rule uh, and that maybe it's not being applied um, kind of objectively or fairly under these circumstances, right, and, and take that higher road. Uh, as John Enton said, I I'm not optimistic uh, about what's going to happen. Uh, and so uh, it's very interesting times to live in. Okay, well, Professor Hill, you can comment on that, but I also have a question specifically for you, which is, how do you think women in law school and young attorneys or even judges have been influenced by uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She inspires girls and teens today. Was that the case when you were in law school and what are your reflections? Absolutely, thank you. And yeah, I'm not sure I have anything much to add on the prior question, you know, except that I have a hard time seeing any universe in which somebody doesn't get appointed, confirmed before uh, the next president takes office. But, uh, but yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, she is a huge inspiration. I think, you know, I will say her star status, um, her sort of pop icon status um, has been much more recent, right? She didn't kind of have that um, notorious RBG thing going on when I was in law school, certainly. Um, actually, the VMI case, the one that we've mentioned a few times, which is really probably her most well-known opinion and um, one of her most important um, in the area of gender equality came out like the right before I started law school um, right before I took constitutional law so um, uh, it was this issue was still very much live right in terms of um, women's access to all the places where um, men have been allowed to go for a very long time. And so um, I do think, at least for me personally, her um, history as an ACLU lawyer was something that really inspired me and to see that you could actually change the world with litigation um, is something that kind of blew me away when I realized it in, in law school and it um, helped shape my own career path to a large extent and I think um, does account for some of the um, sort of popularity um, of that career path for people who want to make a difference, particularly in, you know, certain areas. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the more recent, the, the extent to which I, you know, I suspect there are going to be like RBG costumes <laughs> at Halloween this year and so on is, is a much more recent thing. It's very cool to see though. In my mind. I actually have them, um, you can't see them, but my earrings are RBG descent collars. Um, that I'm wearing tonight, so. <laughs> Very appropriate. Um, so we have a question about, does anybody have any predictions about whether the Democrats, if they win, will expand the court in response to an appointment um, that goes through now? Anybody? I, I don't have a prediction on that, but I think it is a terrible idea. Um, for, there's nothing in the Constitution that fixes the number of seats, but we've had, we've had a nine justice court for a, more than 150 years, um, and that's been kind of a tradition. My concern is that if the Democrats win the White House and the Senate and keep the House, um, and they manage to push through an expansion of the court. First of all, if they're concerned about getting the quote right outcome, they're going to have to increase the, the size of the court by four, not just two, assuming that the new justice is appointed. But whatever the number is, two can play at that game. If the Democrats increase the size of the court when they're in control, then the Republicans, when they are in control, will do the same thing. And Somewhere along the line, somebody is going to decide we're going to try to increase the court by an enormous number, at which point the ability of the court to do its work will be called into question. And more to the point, the idea that we're going to change the size of the court because we, we don't like the current ideological 
composition of the court, suggests basically that law is only politics. And I think that that is fundamentally destructive of the whole reason that we have law and courts. I'm not naive. Surely there are some political aspects to, to, to the law, but I think it would be a terrible mistake for us to decide that's all that's going on here. If I could jump in, uh, I can't, uh, I'm going to say I can't disagree with Jonathan more vehemently on this issue. Uh, maybe it's a generational thing. Uh, I remember, I believe it's an old Sean Connery quote about, uh, you know, it's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. Uh, under these circumstances, uh, I, I would have agreed with the much more traditional custom, uh, you know, following custom approach towards appointing justices. Um, but essentially, the Republicans under Senator McConnell have already blown up that process. Uh, and to the, if Democrats are going to say, well, we are going to rely and kind of, you know, a la Michelle Obama, take the high road, uh, they will essentially be uh, kind of enabling a court that does not view itself as a fundamental body of legal principled reasoning. Uh, you know, just think about uh, the, the judge uh, that's being nominated or potentially considered uh, who was a professor at, uh, you know, uh, Notre Dame, right? The fundamental that uh, the Bible and uh, kind of can serve as more important uh, principle than the constitution and its founding. And that precedent doesn't matter under those circumstances, right? The fundamental rejection of precedent when the court has gotten it, in her opinion, wrong. Uh, and, and that's a problem, right? And so to the extent that the, you, we want to preserve a system of separation of powers, uh, the Supreme Court is a fundamental element of that. And if it takes the Democrats to, you know, essentially play uh, and respond to uh, the, the Republicans' game of hardball with hardball politics of their own, which I think they fundamentally must, uh, then that it leads to whatever consequences it leads to. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that uh, Professor Cass Sunstein argued years ago uh, is that the Constitution and constitutional law can change not just by formal amendment uh, or by necessarily Supreme Court's interpretations, but the changes in the political system and the election of representatives and the election of the president, right? So if we have uh, the public saying, now it is time for the Democrats to control Congress and the presidency, and we know what the stakes are on the Supreme Court. You know, it may very well be an important signal that in our system that you know we shouldn't allow one party to essentially have taken uh, at least one seat uh, and then kind of arguably leverage that into two, right? And and so um, yeah, this is a, you know, a fundamental thing that we need to respond to. Any as, other as reflections? Folks might expect that I disagree with uh, much of what Ray said. I'll just say first on, on Judge Barrett, if people want to know about her views, um, ignore a lot of the stuff that's being written and said, and watch and listen to the speech she gave here at, at Case Western last year. Um, but the idea that her view is the Bible, that the Bible supersedes her oath uh, as a jurist, uh, I, I think is, is plainly belied by her performance on the bench, as well as by her writings, both as an academic, including uh, the speech she gave here at the law school and which was just published uh, in the case Western Law Review. In, in terms of um, uh, what happens with the court, I think it's important for us to understand that the politics of judicial confirmations have been a game of escalating retaliation at this point for 35 years, uh, in which each party has decided not merely to retaliate in kind to the offenses of the, pro of the other party, but to do so and then some. It's kind of like two kids sitting in the back of backseat of a car during a road trip where it's not enough to nudge the one next to you. If they nudge you, you gotta hit them a little harder and eventually someone starts striking real blows and that's what's happened. Uh, but the idea that either party has not engaged in escalatory retaliation is simply false. Uh, and in fact, in earlier times, um, folks were very open on, and upfront about it. Um, in the mid-1980s, when um, Senate Democrats decided they did not like the sorts of people that Ronald Reagan was appointing to the federal bench, uh, 
uh, and thought that this effect was untoward, even though Jimmy Carter at the time had a record number of lower court appointments in a single term for any president, a record that uh, the current president is, is unaware that he has not matched despite his bombastic rhetoric to the contrary. Uh, they were very open about the fact that they were going to find ways of blocking nominees and in fact, refused to fill seats pending elections with the hope that those seats could then be filled by a Democratic president. So Judith Hope was the pivotal seat on the DC circuit in 1988. Uh, she was never confirmed uh, for that reason. Pam Reimer, the same thing. Uh, Democrats didn't win that election, so Pam Reimer got renominated. So we've forgotten her story and we forgot Judith Hope's story because she was not renominated because she had supported Bob Dole. Uh, and to give another story that would, is probably fitting given that we're talking about the legacy of, of Justice Ginsburg, Lillian Bevere, who was the first full female full professor at the University of Virginia Law School, uh, one of the most important female uh, constitutional law professors, in fact, scratch female, one of the most important First Amendment scholars of her generation, was nominated to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit in October 1991 to a seat that was a newly created seat. So there was no dispute over this having been a seat that someone else didn't get to fill or whatever else. And she went 13 months without a hearing, let alone a vote or whatever else. And that action, the action that what was done to Hope and Reimer and others is what Republicans clearly retaliated to, reta retaliated against when Bill Clinton became president. And then Democrats retaliated again against Republicans uh, when it came to George Bush's nominees, including escalating uh, the process by introducing the filibuster of lower court nominees for the first time in the nation's history. And Republicans then retaliated again uh, to Obama's nominees. And at some point, um, uh, so folks need to recognize that escalating retaliation uh, ultimately deprives the courts of what we want them to do, which is to be a check on the political branches. Uh, and uh, if, if neither side is willing to engage in some sort of de-escalation, uh, that is where we would end up. Last thing I would note, I think there is some hope from the court itself. Um, there are at least, there's at least one, if not more justices on the court that believe trying to have the court recede from its role in public life uh, and in political life is one way to lessen the stakes. And pursuant to that, it is worth noting that since John Roberts has been Chief Justice, the rate at which federal statutes have been struck down and the rate at which the court has overturned its prior precedents is lower than under any other post-war Chief Justice. And it's not even very close. So in terms of having the Supreme Court being less of a uh, veto to the political branches, we've been moving in that direction. And hopefully if the political branches can't figure out how to deescalate, that trend in the Supreme Court uh, may help us save us from this mess a little bit. If I can just add one quick question to John, uh, given, given your, your very good factual recitation, how many chief justices of the Supreme Court have been appointed by the Democrats since the 1950s? Successfully appointed? Yes. Well, there, have, um, there haven't been any. The last effort was Abe Fortas, which was done in an election year uh, because Earl Warren wanted to retire before the election because he did not think he could last another four years. And it was very controversial for a range of reasons. So Southern segregationists opposed him because he had supported civil rights. Um, he was opposed in part because of ethical concerns, but he was also opposed by some Senate Republicans who were upset by the transparently political timing of it especially because in 1960, the Senate uh, with the Democratic majority had passed a resolution saying that we should try to avoid election year vacancies because they had been so upset by the election year vacancy in 1956 that Dwight Eisenhower had filled with the recess appointment of William Brennan. And even though William Brennan was a Democrat, it was understood that Dwight Eisenhower did that for political advantage uh, by uh, putting a Catholic, uh, only the second Catholic ever in the history of the Supreme Court on the court. And so up until 1968, Democrats had been firmly against the idea of a vacancy in an election year. And that was necessary for, uh, to, to push the votes against Fortas over the top. So it's been a problem. Um, there's a reason why since 1968, the only times we've had election year vacancies have been due to tragic deaths because justices have recognized it's, it's something our political process doesn't handle very well. And we're seeing right now it does not handle this very well. Jesse, do you have any comment on any of that? I mean, I, you know, I, I just think that the question of, of who started it is less um, important at this point than 
um, questions around, you know, what, what, right, what is the impact of continuing it? And, you know, I think Ray has made a point that hasn't been really, um, but I, I probably disagree with Ray. I've been going back and forth about this myself over the past few days, and I think it's probably still a bad idea for all the reasons I have thought that all along um, to pack the court. But I will say that Ray raises a point that hasn't been responded to um, about the um, sort of very uh, big disconnect between the composition of the Supreme Court right now and the, um, you know, sort of mainstream of the American people. And, you know, the, the, and the same thing being true of kind of the, the Senate as well in terms of how our, um, you know, our, 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 our political institutions are not constructed to reflect popular will. So I got and another one, two other things that I think will affect this going forward that, that I think the Senate is actually more likely to consider. Um, there's renewed conversation of jurisdiction stripping, of, um, of finding ways of constraining the ability of the courts to consider certain sorts of questions. And I would not be at all surprised to see discussions of that uh, after the election. Uh, and in terms of finding ways of rebalancing the political process, I think it's far more likely that if we have a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president, uh, that DC and Puerto Rico become states, then they increase the size of the Supreme Court. I agree with that. So we just have a very few minutes left, but um, I got a question about, another question about the composition of the Supreme Court. Um, and the questioner said there are six Catholic justices and two Jewish justices. And of course, Justice Ginsburg was Jewish and died on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, uh, of the high holidays. So what's, what's up with that? Do we, um, and the nominee now may well be uh, another Catholic. Is that of significance? Is it, are we going to have a Protestant justice at some point? Any comments on that? Well, we have a Protestant justice now. That's Justice Gorsuch. There was, there was a point at which there were, I think there were no Protestant justices. Um, my sense is that one reason that there are so many Catholic justices on the court is that some of the issues that are particularly salient to important segments of the Republican Party uh, are issues where conservative Catholics may be viewed as more reliable than other folks. Um, I don't have great insights on this, but I suspect that that, that may have something to do with with this. Um, but I also am a little concerned that we're even getting bogged down in the religious composition of the court. I mean, th there's a substantial body of part of the American population today that doesn't identify with any particular re religious background. And, you know, I mean, to, to paraphrase Roman Rusko back in the day when he was talking about Harold Carswell, aren't they entitled to representation themselves? Anybody else have any thoughts? I, I think when it comes to any uh, any of these sorts of characteristics, it, it might be worth remembering uh, a comment that Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg made when asked about the proper number of female justices on the court. And her response was, why not nine? And I think you know the aspiration should be that people are chosen to be justices because of what they bring to the court in terms of their experience, their capabilities, and their qualifications. And, and not these other characteristics. And so the fact that we may end up with six Catholics on the court if, if uh, the president nominates and the Senate confirms another Catholic, I think that's less important than what we think about the individual justices. Uh, Justice Thomas and Justice Sotomayor are both Catholics. Uh, it's not as if they have similar approaches to the law as a result of that. Um, and uh, so I, I think we should be focused more about this on, on the substance of, of their views and how they approach their jobs. Okay, well, I got a question in the chat uh, noting that I teach employment discrimination and health law um, and was Justice Ginsburg important to those fields? What is her legacy? And of course, she is very, very important um, in both of, of those fields. She is a, uh, a pioneer in terms of fighting discrimination and gender discrimination is still a huge issue. 
uh, in employment discrimination. We talked about the Lily Ledbetter case um, that had to do with equal pay. Of course, she dissented in that case, um, but eventually Congress passed a law that, that mandated that changed the rules for bringing Equal Pay Act claims in ways that are very helpful to plaintiffs. Um, in health law, Jesse talked about reproductive rights, um, and she was very important in those areas of litigation, though she didn't write majority opinions uh, most of the time. But um, I think lawyers, especially female lawyers, have her as an icon and a hero and, and will not soon forget her for everything that she contributed, both in the fields of employment discrimination and, uh, and health law uh, for women's rights. So I think we are pretty much um, out of time. We, uh, we still have questions, but I don't think we have time to tackle them. So I just want to thank our fabulous speakers. This was thrown together in a couple of days, obviously, um, but it was really a, a great program. And I think everyone learned a lot and we really appreciate the time you put into preparing for it on such short notice. Um, and also thank you to everyone who attended. We had a terrific turnout again on very short notice, which is um, a credit to, to Justice Ginsburg and really shows us how much people cared about her and will miss her and, and what an impact she had on American jurisprudence. Um, so thank you to everyone. Have a good evening. Um, and we hope to see you soon at another Case Western program.